Hello, everyone, and welcome to this event, uh, GSAP event, this very special event on the preservation of disability. My name is Jorge Otero Pailos. I'm the director of the Historic Preservation Program. Um, and it is a great pleasure to introduce David Gisson, who has organized this event in celebration of the special issue of Future Anterior that he has guest edited, and I'll, this is the issue right here, an amazing um, trailblazing issue really on this question of um, disability and preservation and how historic sites are intervened in and how we think more deeply about, uh, about the, the role of disability and helping us push the boundaries of preservation. This um, boundary pushing work um, has defined David's career, and he has really uh, worked at the intersection of a number of disciplines, in particular, of course, uh, architecture, history, experimental design, and preservation. He is professor of architecture uh, and urban history at Parsons School of Design and the New School University, and he was Aero Saarinen Visiting Professor of Architecture at Yale University between 2019 and 2020. Also a university professor at the Institute for Art and Architecture at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna in Austria, and former professor at the California College of Arts where he was based for 12 years. Now, David's books include the materialist study of architecture and the modern urban environment titled Subnature, Architecture's Other Environments, which was published in 2009, and a magnificent history of New York City told through the design of the city's air, titled Manhattan Atmospheres, uh, which I recommend both books, I, I recommend to all of you. He's also an artist and has done some historic reconstruction projects and preservation works that have been exhibited at the Venice Biennale in 2016 and 2020, the Canadian Center for Architecture, Yale University Architecture Galleries and the Museum of the City of New York. Um, he uh, uh, had been working on this special issue for uh, a long time and I think it really brings together um, an amazing array of points of view which he's going to um, introduce in a second. Many of the speakers here today are participants in the issue and some have other relationships to um, to Columbia and to Future Anterior. And uh, if I may have a shout out to Rob Garland Thompson, who was the first editor of, uh, of Future Anterior. And so it's wonderful to have Rob back. It's an honor to have David uh, do this event uh, and a sincere uh, honor and pleasure to have all the speakers here. So welcome to this virtual event and thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Jorge. Um, I really appreciate that uh, introduction. Um, as Jorge mentioned, today's symposium marks the publication of the future anterior issue, uh, Preservation and Disability. And I, I wanna thank um, uh, Jorge uh, so much, um, not only for sponsoring this project, but really shepherding it along with his um, graduate students, Whitney Bears, Scott Goodwin, and Maura Carey Wang who um, all helped uh, make the publication possible. Um, I, of course, also want to thank all of the authors who worked with us over the past two years to make this publication possible. And I'm really grateful to um, Dean Andreos for including today's event in the fall lecture series and Lila Catelier for um, organizing and, and bringing the whole affair um, together. So my own interest in the topic of disability and preservation um, stems fr from my own physical stru uh, struggles uh, when visiting historic architectural sites. But it also stems from larger conceptual struggles with how we imagine the architectural past relating to human impairment. Um, in the past 30 years, we've seen increasing efforts by preservationists, uh, conservators, and architects to make historic sites more accessible for their impaired uh, visitors. So this, this kind of work includes um, things that are probably familiar to, to many of you, the increased use of ramps, elevators, braille panels, and even touch tours among many other strategies. 
And all of this work is very important because um, at, some, at some very basic level, uh, we can think of the entire city as a historic artifact and it's transformed through maintenance and preservation practices that are ongoing. So in, in, um, in these introductory remarks, it's important to note that when developing access strategies, uh, preservationists often describe a, a desire, a strong desire to, to balance um, a monument or a site's historical authenticity with the desire or even the demands for increased uh, disability accessibility. And many other symposia on the topic of disability and preservation um, have explored and focused on this problem of, of balance between the authentic and, and, the, and the desire demands for access. So, but as we will see today, um, several of our speakers adopt a completely different approach and really attempt to move beyond this particular um, binary. So while it may be surprising to some, um, many historic sites and monuments actually owe their architectural form to their engagements with impaired people. And this has a very long history. It includes well-known ancient and medieval religious sites, as well as key sites in the history of preservation as a professional practice. And so in, in these cases, disability is authenticity. Um, similarly, the subject of impairment often shadows um, many sites that eventually become uh, historic monuments. And this can be due to a site's um, historic transformation through war and civil conflict, or it can be due to practices of preservation itself that may disrupt the use or the ability to um, easily access an area of the city. Now, the, the final point is that um, there's often an assumption in many contemporary discussions of disability access and architectural preservation that uh, disabled people are simply the visitors to be accommodated within various sites. And as our last speaker, Georgina Klieg will demonstrate, conservators can bring an attribute such as their own blindness into a preservation practice. So collectively, I think we can see today's speakers uh, enabling us to move away from the idea of balance and towards uh, what is for me and I think all of us a more fantastic possibility, which we can call the preservation of disability itself. And I believe this provocative coinage, coinage um, which is inspired by one of our speakers, Rosemary Garland Thompson, it suggests a way, this provocative coinage suggests a way that, that the practice of preservation might maintain difficult and sometimes discomforting subjects, subjectivities, and experiences into the material um, aesthetics of what we consider history. So our first speaker today, um, who will explore uh, many of these ideas, is uh, Vanda Kaja Lieberman. Um, Vanda is an architectural and urban historian and professor of architecture at Florida Atlantic um, University. Um, her numerous publications and research focuses on theories and practices of architecture and urbanism in relationship to disability pol politics. Um, I think of Vanda's writing as, as among a small group and some of the first that brought critical ideas from disability studies into dialogue with uh, contemporary forms of architectural historiography and theory. And uh, she is currently working on a book manuscript titled Architecture's um, Problem with disability that's due out from Rutledge. So our second speaker is uh, Sun Young Park, a scholar of 19th century France, who studies the intersection of architectural, urban, and medical history. Um, Sun Young is a associate professor in the Department of History and Art History at George Mason University. Um, she wrote the book, Ideals of the Body, Architecture, Urbanism, and Hygiene in Post-Revolutionary Paris, and is finishing up her second book, The Architecture of Disability in Modern France. And this project investigates how uh, architectural and urban engagements with blind, deaf, and physically disabled subjects um, between the late 18th and uh, early 20th centuries. Um, uh, and uh, Sun Young's article in Future Anterior is actually drawn from some of this research. So our third presentation is uh, by a duo, um, Rosemary Garland Thompson and uh, Rob Thompson. So Rosemary Garland Thompson is a bioethicist, a humanities scholar, 
and professor based at Emory University. Uh, many of you with us today may, may know Rosemary's work through the um, articles she has written on disability for the New York Times and that are now being transformed into the book um, About Us, essays from the New York Times about disability by people with disabilities. Um, she, Rosemary is a foundational figure in the field of disability studies um, via her many books and articles, um, including Staring, How We Look, and her current project, um, Embracing Our Humanity, A Bioethics of Disability and Health. So Rob Thompson, as um, uh, Jorge mentioned, is a, is a graduate of the uh, preservation program at, uh, at Columbia. Um, Rob is the federal preservation officer for the Presidio Trust, um, a US federal agency responsible for managing the Presidio of San Francisco. Um, it's one of the most visited uh, national parks in the United States. Um, Rob has worked for the trust for a long time, for almost 15 years, and he manages the agency's historic preservation program. Um, prior to the Presidio, Rob worked for the Getty Conservation Institute, um, where he developed a variety of global training programs for preservation practitioners. And he is the co-author of a very important study called um, Architectural Conservation in Asia, National Experiences and Practice, which is really the first um, comprehensive survey of uh, preservation policy and practice um, across uh, all Asian countries. So our final speaker today is Georgina Klieg. Um, Georgina is professor of English at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, her collection of personal essays, Sight Unseen, is a classic in the field of disability studies. Um, like Rosemary, Georgina is a, a foundational figure um, in the field of disability studies. Um, Georgina's latest book, in which I encourage all of you to, to read, is called uh, More Than Meets the Eye, What Blindness Brings to Art. And it's concerned with blindness and visual art, um, how blindness is represented in art, how blindness affects the lives of visual artists, and how museums can make uh, visual art accessible to people who are blind and visually impaired. Um, she has lectured and served as consultant to art institutions around the world, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art Art in New York City and the Tate Modern Museum in London. So um, before I'm handing it off to Vanda, who will give our first presentation, I just want you to note that I'm sure many of you will, um, in the audience will have questions for our panel. Um, please use the Q&A field on the bottom to ask your question, and then I will um, read from these uh, later during the, um, uh, the Q&A portion of today's program. Okay, thank you very much again to Jorge. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, Vanda, we, uh, are looking forward to your presentation. Hello, everybody. Uh, I want to first thank David Agisson and Jorge uh, Otero Pilos for their work on this issue and in their work on future interior in general, and for all the editors who worked on this, and to Lila Catelier for all of the hard organizing work. It's an honor to be on a panel with these um, scholars in, in disability studies and architecture. Um, so my presentation in some ways um, focuses on what David referred to, which is this kind of balance or maybe even binary between architecture and heritage. Next. Next slide. Uh, um, next slide, please. Ah, uh, mm. Yes, thank you. So um, I think that um, while balance is often the word that's used, I think a lot of times it's sort of perceived also as a trade off. So if you are giving access, you're often destroying quote unquote authentic fabric uh, or the true heritage of a site. And in order to sort of look at this, I examined two prolonged um, battles over kind of beloved uh, architectural, historical architectural sites. One in um, uh, California, San Francisco, City Hall, and one in Boston's Beacon Hill. Um, and these sites I, are, were difficult in part because they were everyday sites that were in use. They were not just, you know, historical sites that people visited for you know, pleasure and recreation, but because they have a kind of daily function still. Next slide, please. Um, in looking at these two sites, they offered insights 
into how public narratives about authentic heritage are used to support or undercut making spaces more democratic by including people with disabilities. In this case, both really focused on wheelchair access, which often sort of becomes the kind of emblem of accessibility in architectural debates. Um, but they also show how ideas of authenticity are really malleable and end up having an impact on also questions of what is public space and what disabled access amounts to. So I'm going to start by briefly summarizing the two cases. Um, one of them is San Francisco City Hall. And on the left is an image of this beautiful Beaux-Arts building from the front. It is the kind of crown jewel of San Francisco's civic center. Um, and on the right is an image of the grand interior with the um, stairway under the rotunda. These are spaces that have been featured in films and people's weddings and so forth. And so they are um, quite well known. Next. Um, these, uh, this building was renovated. It was severely damaged in the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. And um, so in the 10 years that followed, $300 million, I believe, was spent in renovating and modernizing all kinds of deferred maintenance and updates, including on the left, you can see the, the scaffolding around the, um, the dome, uh, which is, uh, was severely damaged in the earthquake. And on the upper right, you can see the, the actual gold gilding of the detailing on the exterior of the dome and the very expensive steel and rubber uh, base isolation system on the lower right slide. Um, these were all meant to make the building, uh, you know, last for a very long time. And it was a Willie Brown, uh, Mayor Willie Brown project. And it was also in somewhat associated with his, especially the gilding with his uh, sort of a decadent, a decadence of his administration. Um, uh, next slide, please. One space, however, in all of these very expensive renovations was omitted, which was in the uh, Board of Supervisors chamber, which is effectively San Francisco's legislature. Um, the Board of Supervisors chamber is highlighted on the plan slide on the right in the upper top corner. And then this is an interior view of it prior post renovation, but prior to the work that I'm about to discuss. So due to very um, complicated issues of extinct materials, tight space and so forth, a lot of loopholes in the kind of intersection of the Secretary of Interior Standards and the ADA building code were used to basically punt making the presidential dais, which is the space that you see at the very end of the left slide, making that accessible, wheelchair accessible. Um, next, please. It wasn't until the newly elected uh, the mayor, Gavin Newsom, who was um, elected in 2004, uh, took office and he appointed his friend and um, ally on the Board of Supervisors, Michaela Aliotto Peer, who you can see here on the upper left, who uses a wheelchair. When he appointed her to the board, the issue of this inaccessible presidential day is, uh, became problem. And in the first year of her term on the board, Matt Gonzalez, who was then board president, refused to change any of his practices and, um, and it made it very difficult for her to have equal access. There's a lot of negotiating and haggling and talking to each other. And basically all those kinds of practices were inaccessible to her. Um, she, uh, when in 2005, when uh, the new board president, Aaron Peskin took the presidency, he ceremoniously gave up the upper dais. And you can see on the right side image, you can see a kind of velvet rope was strung across that space and a ramp, a kind of short ramp was built to the clerk's desk, which then became turned into the um, presidential uh, seat. And then the clerk sort of sat below on the ground uh, in a kind of more portable uh, uh, desk. Um, However, Aliotto Pierre did not find this to be a sufficient solution. Um, I'm going to call this the ad hoc or uh, as is solution um, because uh, she and she argued successfully um, with the support ultimately of the mayor's office on disability that this was not making the space sufficiently democratic to everyone. Um, next, please. 
Her threatened ADA lawsuits under the ADA brought in a kind of very complex process uh, um, spearheaded by the Mayor's Office on Disability. Susan Misner was in charge of that and brought in uh, Paige and Turnbull, very, you know, renowned uh, architectural preservation firm in San Francisco um, and, and, and beyond uh, to uh, make many, many different proposals. And after four years of all kinds of politicking and negotiating, the um, image on the right is a is uh, the solution was basically to lower the upper desk um, to 12 inches below, uh, to 12 inches above the existing floor to move the clerk's desk to be flush with the existing floor and to add this kind of curved ramp. Um, and you can see on the left that this uh, is a disassembly detail. So it required a very um, careful removal and storage of uh, uh, many of the existing elements because this is a Manchurian oak material, which is one of the points of contention, which is since the construction of this space has been made extinct. So there was no way to really it, it replace it exactly the same way. Um, the, this, this development of this solution ended up pitting sort of two camps against each other. Um, and this, uh, and it became highly politicized with an article in the um, Chronicle that called this the million dollar ramp. And this ultimately became viewed as the kind of elitist solution because it spent so much money on a chamber that was viewed as being part of an elite space as opposed to being kind of the most public political space in the city, which it actually is because is, the deliberations are always open to the public. And in fact, because Aliotto Pier herself is a scion of a very wealthy and influential family, it became associated with her personally. And it ended up kind of taking this space and the debate around the space out of the public realm and kind of privatized it and made it seem like a niche um, elitist issue. Um, and the, this was also pitted against the ad hoc solution, which many people were for, partly because it was inexpensive, but also because it was viewed as leaving the authentic, the, the word that David used earlier, fabric, the existing original fabric intact and kind of showing the kind of layers of time and change. Um, but as I said, the mayor's office on disability um, sort of buttressed by Aliotto Pierce claims uh, did not see that as a sufficiently democratic solution. Next, please. And here you can see the presidential dais before on the left. Um, you can see that the desk is a bit higher. There is no ramp. There's just flanking stairs on both sides um, that lead both to the clerk's desk and to the higher central presidential desk. And on the right, you can see, I mean, it. I, I think one of the things that is evident is that um, the, the solution, the final solution that was constructed and opened in 2012, which you see on the right, is we would consider this a quite a seamless um, sort of integration of access, which is definitely one of the primary reasons that it was favored by the kind of official um, access proponents um, uh, position. Next, please. So on the other side of the continent, I compared uh, the San Francisco case with uh, the still ongoing case of the Beacon Hill neighborhood in Boston. Um, those of you who have been here or have heard of it, you know that it is one of the most exclusive and expensive neighborhoods in San Francisco. It is a, a kind of a major um, point of tourist interest. Um, and these pictures kind of show what its character is. They are very narrow streets and sidewalks, beautiful brick buildings, steep, often steep streets and crowded with, the sidewalks are crowded with um, all kinds of street furniture. Next, please. And uh, the, this is the condition of the existing um, so-called curb ramps, where they exist at all, they tend to be very uneven. There have been years and hundreds of lawsuits and complaints, and there has been a lot of stalling by the Beacon Hill Civic Association, also known as the BHCA, um, to, that have basically prevented any installation of new construction. Um, next. 
Uh, in 2005, I believe, the incoming mayor, Marty Walsh, um, basically finally took control of the situation and under the banner of safety, um, he uh, sort of started a construction without receiving a kind of certificate of appropriateness or basically without receiving approval from the neighborhood commission itself. Um, he, to, you know, to be clear, he never used uh, any kind of preservation discourse, unlike the um, pro uh, access proponents in San Francisco, nor did he talk about civil rights in any way. It was always under safety, which is actually a kind of a lamentable thing because a lot of um, access proponents find that in architecture, um, disability access is almost always sort of a legal technical issue rather than being understood in sort of more creative architectural terms. Um, the solution actually, as you can see here, is a concrete, um, you know, apron with wings and it, it has, instead of the more standard yellow tactile pad, they did have a compromise after feedback with a number of the neighborhood groups um, and made it, it sort of a dark red brick colored tactile pad. However, the BHCA still wanted it to be made out of brick and they wanted to have a color, um, a powder coated uh, cast iron tactile pad, which was both very costly, but it would also create a kind of inconsistency of accessible, there's be a sort of not a universality across the city of access features. So this became a very um, tense uh, um, public a dispute um, with the BHCA suing or the city and getting an injunction. Next, please. And, and um, using all kinds of discussions about how historically um, Boston is the brick city and that neighbors in, uh, there is a kind of history of the neighbors who live in um, Beacon Hill of having, uh, you know, taken to various kind of civil unrest or or different kinds of protest mechanisms to prevent earlier efforts by the city to remove brick from the sidewalk. So the, this is from 1947, and it's kind of a famous image that is used to circulate around Boston and particularly the Beacon Hill Society to sort of reference their kind of guardianship of the patrimony of Boston, which they see as being a big sacrifice on their part that they contribute to the city's um, uh, kind of value and history. Next, please. The debate, um, as I mentioned, had to, you know, took place over many years, many public meetings, um, but also this is a, a sort of a, a selection of the comments and to an article in the Boston Globe. And as you can see, it says Beacon, people in Beacon Hill are not liberal, far from it. Liberals have empathy. They think of others before themselves. Another reader writes, yikes, the horror, yellow, oh my God. Now anyone can use our sidewalk. What's next? Handicapped parking? And a third uh, in this little clip that I took says, quick, we better start another association. This one isn't working. It appears they're going to allow anyone who wants to use our sidewalks. So this, as you can see, took on a pretty strong class warfare dimension. Um, you know, with disabled access curbs here, taking on a populist kind of common man aura, almost the exact opposite of what happened in San Francisco. Because of the recent Boston bombing, um, some uh, journalists, as well as John Winsky, who's the executive director of the Disability Policy Consortium in Boston, kind of raised the, you know, created an association between the many, many people who had been permanently disabled by the bombing, which happened a year before, and the kind of exclusion that this represented, the sort of unwillingness to build sidewalks that would be accessible. Um, next, please. Uh, other people raised questions that had to do with like, what is really authentic? Because in this one of them, those people was again, the same John Winsky I mentioned. Um, you know, they, uh, Beacon Hills uh, Civic Association has special lampposts that they get designed. They, they do require the city to spend extra money on sort of everyday uh, furnishings, urban street furnishings, but they don't 
seem to object to other things. Um, here I'm showing, for example, a traffic signal that's electrified. And you can also see something as mundane as asphalt paving. These streets used to be all cobblestone. And in the winter, and actually I think, I mean, sorry, in the summer, and you can see this in the distance here as well on the image on the left, which is sort of just the intersection of Charles Street and another street that leads uphill. You can see also an air conditioner slotted into a window, which obviously is also anachronistic with the historical period of Beacon Hill. And John Winsky pointed out why are cars allowed and what is it that is so offensive or so corrosive to um, authentic heritage that Beacon Hill Association had literally for, you know, if the ADA starts in 1991 implementation, you know, had for 20 something years been stalling on the um, installation of them. Next, please. I think one of the things that these, both of these projects raise is um, the kind of question about what people find acceptable and, and how those even disrupt or contradict um, official uh, policy or best practices of architectural preservationists. For example, this is in San Francisco, this little hairline border is the only uh, remaining evidence that this current design was not original to the space. This is actually a, a panel that was fabricated. The lower piece is a panel that kind of covers up the area where the stairs were and meets the um, original Manchurian oak paneling above. Um, and in a, in a question sort of, you know, why is this kind of historical simulacrum uh, the favored solution in both Beacon Hill, where the BHCA, as I said, is still promoting this brick and cast iron design. And a uh, same here where, you know, other solutions were um, rejected because they would look like they were, quote unquote, retrofitted or afterthoughts, as Amy Hamray puts it in an article for the Smithsonian. Um, but I kind of argue something a little bit different, which is you know, this suggests that disabled access was always built into the landscape. And I think a lot of people in the access, um, you know, politically motivated access community, which I'm also a member of, sort of see this as being a positive thing to make it look like it had always been there. But from an architectural standpoint, it's also historical fiction. And it's predicated on the idea that access elements are unsightly. And of course, sometimes they certainly are. Um, but that the kind of you know, the, in, the, the kind of historical uh, false image of always having been there is more important than the historical truth. Um, and sort of to conclude then, you know, borrowing from public history and urban geography, um, thinking about how one builds access into, especially maybe everyday environments that are still working environments um, that don't follow either maybe the Beacon Hill or San Francisco cases, it's possible to think of um, the idea of authenticity maybe more in the way that Paul Groth and Dolores Hayden talked about, which is that they are kind of public histories, that the urban landscape is a public history that records social transformations. And to that end, I would say that disabled access needs to be reframed as a form of cultural practice, a social art of remembering, um, a heretofore, you know, left out population and that that sort of records how over time society has changed. Although that was the very argument that was rejected in San Francisco. But heritage knowledge should be opened up beyond traditional professional forms of architectural and archeological expertise to include what Jeremy Wells and Barry Stiefel call civil experts. This would not only encourage community participation, which I think um, is always something that these projects should uh, strive for, but it considers forms of lay expertise, such as the acumen of wheelchair users in Beacon Hill navigating, you know, icy sidewalks as central to heritage knowledge making. Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to thank David and Jorge as well for organizing this event and um, for their work on putting together the future interior volume on disability and preservation. Uh, my contribution to that issue takes us back several centuries um, and it's centered on the National Institute for Deaf Youth in Paris, a school that dates back to 1760 and was the first of its kind in world history. 
It's still in operation today and has occupied the same site since 1794. Architecturally, it's a bit of a historical hodgepodge. This was the site of a Jansenist seminary from the 17th century and comprised four structures of varying provenance, the oldest dating back to the early 15th century. Those buildings were all either rebuilt um, or renovated in the early 19th century, resulting in the form and appearance that you see here. Despite its obvious importance in the history of disability education, this institute is not one that appears to engage preservation issues in an integral way. It was a school specifically intended for a deaf community, whereas complications have tended to arise when a more general use public building of historic merit has had to consider accommodating its non-normative users. Moreover, deaf students, unlike blind or physically disabled individuals, did not require customized architectural features for accessibility or navigation. And though the Deaf Institute took over a site with a long and rich history, the existing structures were never officially deemed historic monuments that should be preserved. However, the key decades of the school's expansion and modernization coincided with the period when the preservation movement was formalizing in France. And I found resonances between what appeared to be unrelated histories that generated insights on our contemporary paradox. Today, architectural conservation projects in the face of disability typically devolve into a fight over historical integrity versus accessibility. As Vonda Lieberman's presentation just demonstrated, this binary construct is artificial, one that can and should be dismantled. Looking at the longer history of the preservation movement further destabilizes this dualism of access versus authenticity. Between the late 18th and early 19th centuries, French society was working through new understandings of both disability and preservation. And both developments were profoundly impacted by the French Revolution of 1789. I found that the political struggle for citizenship on the part of deaf and blind subjects in this period mirrored an expansive approach to historic conservation as an instrument of democracy. So this investigation for me was something of a thought experiment of using two parallel developments to generate new perspectives on both. Let me begin with some background on the history of preservation in France and its links to the 1789 revolution. Art historian Lauren O'Connell has argued that the conversion of monarchical and religious buildings into Republican structures during the revolution marked a first step toward a politics of preservation. A government body instituted in 1795, the Council of Civic Buildings, oversaw the design and planning of all public buildings in the nation. And from the start, they endeavored to identify monuments and buildings worth conserving for artistic merit. A preservationist ethos emerged from and through their work of architectural repurposing as expropriated properties rather than being demolished, were put to secular and more democratic uses, such as prefectures, public schools, and courthouses. Uh, on the screen, you're seeing one example here of a hospital installed in the main pavilion of a former abbey, which the revolutionary government expropriated and nationalized in 1791. These activities set the stage for the institutionalization of preservation in 1830 with the creation of the government post Inspector of Historic Monuments, which is sort of a key moment in the history of um, preservation. His role involved identifying structures that merited being classified and protected as a historic monument. So this development happened at a time when a new regime, the July Monarchy, hoped to achieve national reconciliation after decades of divisive politics and revolutions. It was thought that pride in their shared past and patrimony would help bring French citizens together. The movement of romanticism in the early 19th century further fueled public interest in picturesque ruins, historic buildings, and preservation. Uh, this print shows a Renaissance palace documented in the illustrated 1820 publication titled Picturesque and Romantic Voyages in Old France. 
The 1820s were marked by rampant real estate speculation and a construction boom in major French cities, which seems to have heightened a sense of loss and destruction. It was in 1825 that the writer Victor Hugo first published a pamphlet titled Guerre aux Demolisseurs, which translates to War on the Demolishers, and was republished in 1832 in expanded form. Uh, in this essay, he pleaded for the conservation of historic monuments and even decried certain restoration efforts as a form of vandalism. For Hugo, the French patrimony embodied a collective national identity that superseded political or ideological divisions. So to return to the Deaf Institute that I began with, the school didn't occupy a site designated as a historic monument, but its architectural development closely followed this history that I've just outlined. The school began in 1760 as a small class run privately by a priest named Charles Michel de Lepé in his own home. In an era when philosophers were exploring the connection between the senses and cognition in new ways, Lepé's work helped advance the important understanding that sensory disabilities are not mental handicaps. At the time of Lepe's death, the 1789 re revolution raised important debates on public education and social welfare, which led to the nationalizing of the deaf school that he had founded in the year 1791. This now public establishment eventually took over the expropriated site of a former seminary, the saint Seminary in 1794 exemplifying the democratic architectural repurposing of the revolutionary era that set the foundation for later preservation efforts. The state architect directing this project in its key years was Antoine Marie Per, who was involved in early conservation and renovation projects through his appointment in the Council of Civic Buildings mentioned earlier. Under his direction, the cloistered religious grounds of old were converted into a state school that aimed to create productive citizens out of disabled and formerly marginalized subjects. In the 1820s, during that building boom that I mentioned in Paris, the school did engage in some wholesale demolitions and new constructions on its campus. Um, you're seeing the main casualty of that moment here, if you follow my cursor a 15th century church that was partially damaged by a fire and eventually torn down and replaced with this building, which housed an assembly hall. But as historic preservation activities formalized in, 18, in the 1830s with government support, the Institute shifted to a strategy of smaller scale re restorations, renovations, and improvements on the remaining structures of its site. It was during this phase that the architect, Per, first began to include information on the historical details and significance of the existing buildings in reports submitted to the Minister of the Interior and Council of Civic Buildings, which oversaw all of this work. Uh, so these elevation drawings on the screen um, are from the 1830s, and they show restoration and renovation plans for the Corps du Logis, which was an early 17th century structure. So in many ways, the architectural trajectory of the Deaf Institute was a product of the early history of the preservation movement. But beyond these connections, I ultimately see a shared narrative about inclusion in the history of the Deaf Institute and the preservationist discourse in these formative stages during and after the 1789 revolution. If uh, disability activists today uh, too often find themselves in a struggle with preservationists over the exclusionary features of historic buildings. Early conservation efforts from the revolutionary era were always about adaption to modern and generally secular and communal needs. The architect Eugène Emmanuel Villeleduc was France's leading conservation architect in the mid 19th century, uh, best known for his restoration of the Notre Dame Cathedral. And in his views, restoration could be a creative act, not simply a work of maintenance or repair, but that of reestablishing an edifice in a state that may never have existed at a given moment, to use his words. I would argue that the nascent conservation activities that set the stage for Viola Le Duc's work actually took this creative impulse a step further by approaching historic monuments as instruments for shaping the more democratic society of the future. 
the Paris Deaf Institute's restoration through adaption for an unprecedented architectural program. And for a student population at the nebulous boundary of ability and disability, embodied the ethos shaping the preservationist discourse in its formative stages when architecture stood at the forefront of a larger struggle over social democracy. The history of preservation, when viewed alongside the history of disability, reveals that conservation once was, and could be again, a fluid and socially inclusive practice, not one of architectural fossilization. I'll conclude with a final thought on how disability and preservation discourses intersected at the Paris Deaf Institute. In retrospect, the history of the school not only suggests a more expansive theorization of preservation, it was also an early site for the conservation of disability, the theme that um, David highlighted in introducing this uh, event. The school's founder, Le Pit, and the deaf teachers and students who found a home there advanced a cultural model of disability before it was theorized as such. The school's members actively aimed to cultivate and preserve deaf language, traditions, and heritage, especially as sign language increasingly came under attack and was eventually supplanted by oralism or lip reading and speaking by the 1880s. The Institute is now itself a classified historic monument, a designation based on its 19th century architectural remodeling by Antoine Maribert, but one that should perhaps be thought of in cultural terms as well. So I will conclude here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, David, Lila, and Jorge, as well as our final panelists for this opportunity and for including uh, Rob Thompson and me in our presentation, or in your presentation today. Uh, we have titled our presentation, Opening the Gates, Adaptive Reuse and the Conservation of Disability. Next slide. We're going to begin today with David Gisson's productive provocation, really, a more radical formulation, David says in his introduction, is the preservation of disability itself. And in our presentation, we're going to be doing two forms of presenting. First of all, I'm going to be showing phrases and words in our PowerPoint screen and reading those words and elaborating on them somewhat. In Rob's part of the presentation, he will be showing words and elaborating on them as well as showing and describing a few images. Next slide. So I'm going to start with some critical disability theory that I wanna offer for us. And we'll begin with uh, three premises or claims, propositions of disability studies, critical disability studies as we call it now, maybe even critical interdisciplinary disability studies. Um, and then we'll move from this theory into a kind of meditation or explication about preservation practice in relation to the Presidio, and then conclude briefly with some theory, again, about the conservation of disability. So one of the first and central claims of critical disability studies is that disability is everywhere once you know how to find it. Now this claim universalizes disability as a existential and essential human lived experience. And it also presents disability not only as a human experience, but as a concept. Next slide. So if we conclude that disability is everywhere, once you know how to find it, we might be able to extend that idea by suggesting that the work of present uh, preservation, pardon me, is to find disability in the built environment. And that's what we wanna think about together collectively today here. Next slide. I also want to offer a definition. This is my definition, one of many, of course, that could be offered by many of us who work in this area of disability. And this definition is that disability is the history 
of our encounters, our human encounters, between flesh and world that is written on our bodies. In other words, existence over time and across space writes or marks on human bodies, on human flesh. And that is the experience of what we call disability over the arc of a lifetime. And I would like to suggest that we can imagine buildings as being like fleshly humans in this way, in that the existence of a building or some built item or object in the environment can be marked similarly by existence in the way that flesh is marked by our existence in the world over time and space. Next slide. The third proposition or claim of disability studies, which is really central to what we're doing here today, in particular, it's central to the presentation that Georgina Klieg will give later on, and that is that the lived experiences of disability give people and communities opportunities for expression, for creativity, for resourcefulness, for relationships, and for human flourishing. So disability seen in this way or understood in this way is generative, it is world making. And the preservation of disability is also a world making enterprise that we are sharing here today. So next slide. Rob will take over here to discuss the Presidio of San Francisco as a case study in adaptive reuse. Thank you, Rosemary, and thanks to all the organizers. Uh, good day, I'm Rob Thompson. And um, my goal here this morning is to build on what Rosemary has said by offering a practitioner's view of incorporating access in the broadest sense into a vast and complex site using existing preservation principles, uh, which serve to meet multiple public benefit goals. Uh, next slide, please. So here I'm showing a map and an image of the Presidio of San Francisco, located at the foot of the Golden Gate Bridge and on the northwest tip of the San Francisco Peninsula. For 218 years, the Presidio served a, uh, an exclusive military function. And this began under the flag of Imperial Spain in 1776, and it ended with the departure of the US Army in 1994. The former military reservation is now a National Historic Landmark District, which is the highest designation that the nation bestows on historic sites, as well as a national park site. And it's managed by a federal agency, the Presidio Trust, which is who I work for, uh, which carries a mandate to, and I quote, preserve the cultural and historic integrity of the Presidio for public use. That quote comes out of the uh, congressionally authorized enabling legislation that uh, drives our work today. Next slide, please. And here I'm showing an image, uh, an aerial image of the Presidio to give um, the audience a sense of the scale of the site. Uh, at 1500 acres and with over 800 buildings, along with roads, infrastructure, design landscapes, residential neighborhoods, and even a golf course, the Presidio is effectively a small municipality that's distinct from the neighboring city of San Francisco. It's surrounded by two sides with water and on the other two sides by a wall, a masonry wall dating from around 1900, which contains seven gates that the army used to actively manage and control access to the post. Next slide, please. And here I'm showing a image from around 1900 of US Army soldiers guarding one of these gates, the Lombard Gate, which was the main entry into the Presidio, uh, both historically and still today. So with the military use now concluded at the Presidio and preservation at the core of the site's mission, 
we are in a position to literally open the gates to the public, along with removing barriers and giving the Presidio a new purpose. Our preservation approach at the Presidio relies on the practice of adaptive reuse, which is generally defined as converting in a, a historic resource for a purpose other than that which was originally intended while retaining its historical, cultural, and architectural values. Next slide, please. And here I'm showing an image of uh, Trust Carpenters, some of my colleagues working on an adaptive reuse project. In this case, conversion of an 1864 officer's family home into an office building. So at the Presidio, we use adaptive reuse projects um, to accomplish a comprehensive suite of functional upgrades to our historic buildings, including new utilities and data systems, seismic strengthening, fire suppression systems, and amenities such as kitchenettes and new bathrooms, along with code compliant accessibility improvements. Next slide, please. And here's an example I'm showing of one such project. This is the lobby of an adaptively reused 1898 barracks building, which now functions uh, as an office. So here uh, we've found and accomplished this, that the sensitive addition of accessibility features such, such as the elevator shown at the back of the image on the left um, and ramps that are used to access the front porch of this particular building by adding these to 19th century buildings, we can successfully put them back into service as revenue producing assets, while also creating usable spaces within the building, such as the attic spaces shown on the right, that the army even just used for storage. So in addition to meeting code and regulatory requirements for access, this practice unlocks significant leasable square footage, which the trust can then rent out to generate revenue to support the park, thus accomplishing multiple public benefit goals I described earlier. Next slide, please. And here I'm showing an image of our main parade, uh, which is a rectangular landscape feature that has been converted from an army era drill field uh, as created in the 1890s. Uh, later, the Army turned it into a parking lot, and today it's a popular public open space. So adaptive reuse of the Presidio's buildings and landscapes has resulted in the creation of a new layer in park's history, one focused on stewardship of its resources and access in the broadest sense to the public. So here I'll turn it back over to Rosemary to offer some concluding thoughts. Thank you, Rob, uh, for that interesting uh, consideration of how the Presidio operates to conserve or preserve disability. We're going to conclude quickly with some uh, definitions that I want to offer. And next slide, please. I'll offer first uh, a kind of thick definition that answers David's provocation. And that is what we might think of as the definition of conserving or preserving disability itself. So conserving disability is a process of managed change that maintains a supportive material environment, a moral ecosystem. That's a term I like to use from that I take from my work in bioethics, a moral ecosystem where human embodied existence can thrive as it transforms over time. So as I said, this is thick, you may wish to consider it. Um, it pulls together, I hope with language, many of the ideas that we have brought forward in our presentation and many of the ideas that I think have been brought forward in the future anterior volume, which I'm very glad to um, be aware of and now to be included in this project. Next slide, a more concise way of talking about this uh, might be to use a verb that I like a lot, and that is the active verb to shape. 
And to say that perhaps our goal in conserving disability is to shape environments, both built and natural and human, to fit humans rather than to shape humans to fit into environments. Final slide. I want to gesture also, or we want to gesture also here to, I think a very interesting provocation that comes from Vonda Lieberman's really wonderful piece in the volume. And Vonda suggests that a purpose of heritage might be to materialize successive liberation movements. And we want to suggest that in some ways, the adaptive reuse that Rob has described here that goes on at the Presidio literally materializes the moments, the times, the decades of the 1970s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s when the Americans with Disabilities Act and the disability rights movement in general mandated a transformation of the built environment, which is a liberation movement for people with disabilities. And it continues and it is materialized at the Presidio and in many other places, of course, through the adaptive reuse that Rob described. So thank you very much. Hello, this is Georgina Klieg. I am the final speaker and I uh, thank David and Jorge um, for organizing this event uh, and for the publication of the volume uh, and Lila for managing um, the PowerPoint, which I believe has now uh, appeared to you. Um, I should mention uh, by way of introduction, I'm a blind person I'm using PowerPoint, uh, which I think of as assistive technology for sighted people. Um, to any blind people in the audience, um, I will be uh, briefly describing images, um, uh, sort of on a need to know basis. But the fact that, you know, obviously if I was knew I was only talking to blind people, I wouldn't bother. Um, but it is my awareness that, that sighted people um, become uneasy if they don't have something to look at. So really the PowerPoint is for our sighted friends. I'm gonna be talking about um, a uh, project I was engaged, I was involved with a collaborative project uh, called Embodied Encounters, um, which was funded by a program at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art uh, called the Artist Initiative. Um, and the program, the Artist Initiative program invited artists to, to submit uh, project proposals um, where they would engage with uh, works in the collection um, in uh, maybe novel or unexpected ways and um, offer public programs and uh, uh, document work um, to engage with, with uh, pieces in the collection. Um, so this was a project uh, which began in 2017. It's, it's ongoing. The documentation of our work together is ongoing. Uh, the lead artist was Fayan Devi, uh, who's an Australia-based artist um, uh, who identifies as a person with a, a visual impairment. Um, and then the other artists I'll mention briefly and say more about them later. Uh, Brian Phillips, also based in Australia, is a sound artist. Shelley Lassica, um, a choreographer, also based in Australia. And myself, who in this project identified uh, myself as a blind person and a ha haptic docent. I'll explain that later. Um, my work on this project uh, it was a continuation of collaborations, several collaborative projects I've done with Fan Devi, uh, provoked by ideas about blind access and visually impaired access to the visual arts. Um, uh, specifically, it came out of work we did together around enlarging our understanding of touch perception of art. 
Um, and it came from a simple premise, which is that in the history of museums, from the, the beginning of the history of museums, uh, there's always been some sort of um, provision for blind visitors, uh, giving them special access to touch uh, works of art and art historical artifacts in museum collections. And as a blind art lover, I have always availed myself of these programs whenever uh, given the opportunity. Um, and uh, I have found them rewarding um, to varying degrees, but I've felt that museums missed an opportunity um, because whenever I've engaged in a touch tour at a museum, I have observed that sighted people uh, observing me or um, people hearing about my experience after the fact are really, really curious, really, really eager to know what, what is that experience like. Uh, basically, I've come to the understanding that everybody wants to get their hands on art, um, but art conservators do not want everybody to get their hands on art. Uh, so it, it is a special accommodation um, uh, provided to a limited number of museum visitors. Um, so anyway, uh, I have felt, and uh, Faye and Devi has also collaborated in this feeling that therefore people who have this special privilege of getting to touch art have a uh, obligation and an opportunity to share that cultural knowledge with institutions and to the, the public that they serve. Um, so that, that access becomes a two-way uh, interaction. It's not just a, a, a charitable act, but bestowed on uh, blind people, but it is blind people um, bringing that knowledge into culture. Okay. Um, the project that we did at SF MoMA involved um, four different works. Uh, the project had a, a conservation element in that we were looking at pieces uh, that were ephemeral. Uh, that is to say that they were not on permanent display. And so in some sense, our interactions with these works were conserving uh, their presence uh, even after they were removed from the museum. And then some pieces um, were ephemeral in the sense that by design, uh, they were uh, made of materials which were um, uh, changing over time. Uh, and so the, the uh, appearance of, of pieces were changing. But I'm only gonna talk about one of them. Next slide, please. Um, and that is the sculpture by Richard Serra, Sequence, um, which was built, uh, finished in uh, 2006. And I have here two images of the sculpture. Uh, on the left uh, is the sculpture in its site where it now resides um, and where it uh, was, was destined always to live uh, at the Cantor Arts Center at Stanford University. Uh, and then the image on the right is uh, a, picture, a picture of it in the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art uh, in a uh, gallery that was built specifically to house it. Um, this is a massive work of sculpture. Uh, it's made of steel, specifically a, a type of steel used in shipbuilding. Um, it weighs, uh, it's, it's made of, up of 12 um, plates, uh, steel plates, um, uh, configured in, as nested S-curves. Um, um, it is eight, uh, 13 feet high. It's uh, 67 feet long by 42 feet wide. Um, it weighs uh, approximately 235 tons. Um, so it's, it's, ex it's an extremely large uh, piece of work. Um, Sarah, uh, 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 like many sculptors, um, has often in interviews and in, in writing complained about the way uh, uh, sculpture is perceived um, and displayed uh, because he, he emphasizes that of course sculpture is a three-dimensional work. 
um, and that it can't be viewed as, as two-dimensional works, uh, paintings uh, are viewed, uh, that it needs to be displayed in a way that allows for um, the people to move around it and view it from all angles. Um, with this piece, its massive size means that you, a, a sighted person literally cannot get a full glimpse of it uh, standing near it. Um, the only way to get a sort of sense of its, of its um, whole design is from a distance or from an aerial view. Um, this piece, like some other pieces by Sarah, is also uh, meant to be moved not only around, but to be moved through. Uh, visitors can um, follow pathways through the sculpture, as I say, configured as nested S curves. So one describes a path that is this kind of figure eight um, through the sculpture. Uh, the walls of the sculpture are not perpendicular to the ground. Uh, so they curve and um, uh, lean uh, in, in different directions, sometimes uh, closing in overhead and sometimes uh, opening outwards. Um, the, uh, so the, the part of the, um, the interest of, of this project is, is that the sculpture was originally designed to be an exterior piece. Uh, then it was me moved to SF MoMA, um, in, uh, 2016 to this uh, custom built gallery where it stayed until 2019. Um, so for the conservators at the museum, uh, this, this posed a, a number of interesting questions, which I'll touch on briefly, uh, which had to do with the fact of, uh, you know, it's having been exposed to the elements, to the air, to pollution, and also to touch uh, when it was um, exhibited at Stanford, and then being brought into the museum to be cleaned, to have its oxidized surface uh, maintained, um, uh, also to, to um, perform some repairs uh, from the way it had been used as an outdoor sculpture. Uh, and then to be displayed as a sculpture is displayed in museums where people are not allowed to touch. And I'll just mention one, one sort of amusing thing that I learned from conservators with this piece is when it first came to the museum in San Francisco, um, they discovered that high up on the interior walls in some of the sections, there were dusty footprints. And apparently um, this came about uh, that visitors to it at Stanford uh, performed a, a rock climbing maneuver where I guess you brace your back against one wall and then you can climb up with your feet against the other wall. Um, this is all to say that um, when it was at Stanford, even though I, th I think there may have been signs outside saying, please don't touch the sculpture, everybody touched the sculpture. Um, whereas in San Francisco, uh, it's in a museum, uh, it was in a museum, there were signs saying, please don't touch the sculpture. And there were uh, uh, patrolling uh, guards who, who um, uh, discouraged people from touching. Um, I am here to tell you that every time I visited the piece at SF MoMA, people were touching the sculpture. Um, but the conservators and uh, the, 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 uh, the museum kind of maintained this policy that it should not be touched. Our project was to um, visit the sculpture, to interact with the sculpture, to think about the sculpture in a number of different ways, to perform workshops with museum staff um, and some public programming, which were um, meant to uh, engage with the sculpture in, in sort of more multimodal, multi-sensory ways. Um, uh, and this involved, uh, the experience of the sculpture as a blind person. Uh, and I'll just say one, one thing about that, to navigate this sculpture, to um, follow its path, its uh, sinuous uh, figure eight path, um, it's impossible for two people to walk side by side, uh, which might be the typical way for a blind person to do this. Um, because one was forbidden from touching, uh, one could not uh, do what blind people often do in such situations, which is known as to shoreline. 
meaning uh, to touch um, intermittently with one's cane, uh, one, one wall to follow its contours and thus navigate that way. Um, to be honest, the, the Statue of Limitations, I think is up when I first encountered this sculpture, which was at Stanford, um, that was how I did it. I did, I did touch the sculpture. Um, uh, but in our encounters um, at uh, SFMOMA, uh, we had to get special permission uh, to be able to touch um, the sculpture so that we could communicate what the experience was. So the piece is a feat of engineering. It's an architectural piece. It's a choreographic object. It imposes a certain kind of movement on the visitor. Uh, we also discovered that it was a sonic object. Uh, this came from an observation uh, when I was there visiting and there were two um, young boys, I think about 10 years old, maybe they were siblings or they were um, friends who were running around the sculpture at uh, great uh, speed and emitting um, little boy sounds. At one point they were obviously in different parts of the structure and they were whooping. So one would say whoop and the other would say whoop. And um, the acoustics um, were really quite remarkable. Um, so this sort of prompted an, an idea of, of engaging with the piece as a sonic um, uh, piece as well as through touch uh, and through sight. Um, next. Slide, please. Okay, so this is an image of myself and Faye and Devi and Brian Phillips inside um, one of the sort of more or less circular chambers at the, at the heart of the sculpture, um, engaged in um, various types of encounters. Uh, Faye is in the, the center of the image. She's holding a, um, a boom microphone. I'm standing um, a little bit to her right, uh, I, I'm probably speaking, I'm not sure what I'm doing. Brian Phillips, the sound artist, is uh, sitting on the floor. He's looking at the uh, recording device. I don't think you can see this, but he has a whistle in his mouth. Um, so to capture some of the sonic elements of this piece, um, uh, we whistled, we clapped, we yelled, we sang, we whispered. Um, uh, as we moved through the space. And all of this was recorded uh, and those recordings are, are being processed. Um, uh, all of this is, is being documented in a multimodal manner in an online publication, which will happen sometime in the future, uh, including video, audio, text, um, uh, so on and so forth. Anyway. Um, Next slide, please. Um, we, we got special uh, permission uh, for me to be able to shoreline uh, inside the, um, the sculpture uh, using my cane, but the museum insisted that I had to put something on the tip of the, the cane. Um, uh, so here I am, uh, and then we had to try out various materials. They had bubble wrap, they had masking tape, they had all sorts of other um, uh, uh, materials. Uh, and and we, it was a negotiation to figure out how we could um, maximize the acoustic effects uh, uh, while still preserving um, the sculpture. Uh, Brian Phillips, a sound artist, is standing with, with me um, as I'm uh, fiddling with this cane. He obtained special permission to hang um, contact mics on the sculpture uh, to rec record the sound of, of my shorn lining and other, other um, sonic and acoustic experimentation we did with the piece. Next slide, please. Um, so here I am uh, again in one of the circular chambers in the middle of the piece and I'm shore lining my cane is, is touching um, uh, very delicately the, uh, the um, walls of the piece. Uh, Shelly Lassica, the choreographer, is um, semi-recumbent on the floor. Uh, part of her project was to take up the provocation of this piece as a choreographic object 
and to um, uh, learn to internalize its choreography and then to perform uh, sort of uh, interpretations of that choreography outside of the sculpture. Um, and this is also part of our idea of, of um, preserving a memory of the sculpture uh, once it would be returned to its site uh, at Stanford, which happened in 2019. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and here I am at, uh, with uh, the choreographer Shelley Lassica walking, uh, circumnavigating the exterior of the piece. Uh, we were um, attempting to uh, uh, memorize um, the form of the piece choreographically. Um, so the, the thing to note about this image is that in, we're, we're walking, but we're in step. Uh, so we were basically um, uh, coaching each other about the, the, pre the precise uh, scale and movement that the piece imposes. Okay, uh, next slide, please. All right, here we are at Stanford. So we did all this work at SF MoMA, and then we went to Stanford uh, where the, to the 6,000 square foot um, concrete slab uh, which originally and now houses the sculpture, um, which is outside the, the museum. So here I am, I have sunglasses on now because it's um, outside. Uh, Brian Phillips is behind me with a boom mic and he's recording um, the sound of my cane. Um, we went there, we wanted to um, try to find the traces of the sculpture on this slab and um, it, it, it was discernible. The thing weighs 235 tons. Um, so there, there was a kind of trace in the con concrete, but it was uh, more, more robust in some areas than in others. Um, we had hoped to perform the complete choreography of the piece there. Uh, unfortunately, the museum has housed uh, some other sculptures on this plaza, sort of temporarily smaller sculptural works uh, were there. So it kind of interrupted our path, but we, we did what we could. Um, uh, my final slide, please. Um, this is just an image of me uh, bent over feeling the, the, the concrete and a particular place where you could feel a, a sort of indentation of um, where the sculpture had rested. Uh, behind me is, um, uh, I'm not actually sure which, which sculpture, but one of the tempor temporarily installed sculptures that was there, um, which remarkably were, were surrounded by these uh, cast iron ballards and very heavy chains, which theoretically I suppose were there to keep people from touching those sculptures. Um, as anybody could notice, it was very easy to reach over these, um, these barriers. Um, uh, so it was kind of an odd um, move by the museum. In fact, the day we were there, there was a school group visiting and there was a little girl who was disturbed by the, the way that the sculptures were chained in. Uh, and she started a petition, which was to free the sculptures. Uh, so of course we all signed the, the petition because of course all the sculptures sh should be free. Um, that's the, the end of my presentation, um, but I'm hoping that it, it gives you an idea of uh, this provocation that Faye and Devi uh, and I uh, initiated in this particular project um, to think about um, alternative uh, modes of engagement with a work of art uh, in the interest of both enlarging cultural knowledge, but in this case also uh, conserving a memory of a piece that had been temporarily housed in the museum uh, and then was returned to it, its original site. Uh, so thank you very much for your um, attention. I look forward to questions and discussion. Thank you. Super. Um, thank you so much, um, everyone, for these um, really provocative and um, uh, exciting contributions. I, um, <laughs> via all the uh, formats we have access to over the web, I'm getting um, texts, chats, and 
one or two uh, questions in um, for you guys. Um, so also to our audience members, I, I strongly encourage you to um, write questions into the Q&A box um, at the bottom. Um, uh, I'm sure you're as provoked as I am by many of the presentations and um, you know, have, have questions for our panelists. Can, can you, all, you can all hear me, I assume? Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, while we're waiting for a few more questions, let me just um, go straight into our, our last presentation, but it's, it's, it's really a question for, for everyone, but um, just to make a, a, something of a segue here. So um, Georgina, your, um, you know, your, your presentation really demonstrates um, what, what, what for me, and I think many of us, the, the possibilities of an idea of the preservation of a disability um, offers that it's a it's a double or triple um, entendre that might um, refer to who gets to become a preservationist. Um, and your project demonstrates what happens uh, when we bring disabled people into the field of preservation and how an artifact like a Richard Sara sculpture that is um, uh, has for many people has such a strong visual bias, a sense of sublimity. Um, might transform um, through your own, not just perspective, but, th but really your own activity, really your own labor as, a, as somebody who's, who's you know, um, using your, um, your cane and other tools to like, um, to record it. Um, by the way, we, I'm sure we all love to hear a recording of that project when it's available. <laughs> so, um, so we're completely beyond issues of accessing a work, I think, and into how the perspectives, interpretations of disabled people might transform the physical character of the past. So I'm wondering if, if um, both you and other, our other panelists have, have some more um, thoughts about what that might mean. Like, like how does opening up the field of preservation um, to, to, to disabled preservationists, or at least their perspectives, um, if not their um, labor. Like how might this transform the physical character of works? There's obviously the issue of, um, of sense, but there's, I'm sure there's other issues that um, some of you thought might be raised by your various contributions um, today into the issue. Well, maybe I'll just add briefly uh, a, a couple of points. I mean, you're, you're articulating maybe the, the whole um, uh, idea behind uh, this project um, and a sort of philosophy that I put forward in, in, in my writing and other works, which is, as I began to say, um, uh, simply asking the question about what, what is the purpose of access, you know? Um, and that, that sometimes in articulations of access, there is a, a, a sort of fuzzy, um, imprecise idea of, of inclusion. Um, but what does inclusion bring with it? Um, and so it's to my mind, um, access in my work with museums, the, the point I'm always trying to put forward is access that merely um, gives people who've been previously excluded or marginalized a point of entry and then essentially says, and now you can go home, you've been enriched and enlightened, is sort of missing the mark um, that access as a kind of radical um, intervention embraces the idea that when you, when you open up the culture to people who've been out of it um, for centuries, the culture is gonna change. It's gonna look different. Um, it's gonna behave differently. Um, and that's, that's scary. Um, and so it, 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 it's understandable that, that uh, sometimes access is not fully realized because uh, you know, well, you can't put a ramp on that, that will ruin the aesthetics. Uh, or you can't put an elevator there because, um, you know, people didn't have elevators in the 19th century. Um, so in, in, in some sense, it's, it's when one recognizes the resistance and the fear to these ty types of ideas, um, but the, the, the next step is to sort of offer um, uh, an improvement, an enlargement 
of what the culture is and what it means. I hope someone else will weigh in on this. I could say a few words because um, David, your question about you know what, how does the practice of you know preservation or restoration change when we open up the practice of preservation actually made me think of um, David Serlin's article in the Future Interior Volume, and I actually see that he's contributed to the Q and A <laughs> chat here, so I'm glad he's still on. But the idea that um, I mean I think Vonda's presentation brings us clearly that what we choose to preserve there's a there's a selection that's being made. It's not a totality. We're choosing which elements are deemed authentic or worth preserving in each case. And um, David Serlin's article was uh, was a really fascinating one because it takes this um, school for the blind and physically handicapped and what chose to get renovated were not anything related to the history of disability of that building, but sort of like other architectural elements. And that if we think about opening up the field of preservation to people with disabilities and that the choice of what is deemed authentic to a building and worth preserving, that that calculus would change. Um, so yeah, that's just one thought that I had and everyone should read David's article. <laughs> that's great. Actually, so yes, um, as Sunny mentioned, David just wrote in. So actually, because his question is related, I'll just, or, and his comment is related, I'll just uh, read what David Serlin just wrote in. He wrote, um, I think one of the things that is raised and engaged by including people with disabilities in the preservation process is to ask, and, and this is also a question, um, what counts as historical and who gets to define the historical value of a building, a community, and a nation? And that seems very much um, at the heart of Sunny and, and Wanda's um, presentations today, as, as well as Rob's, um, some of Rob's expertise and, and Rosemary's provocations as well. I might jump in. Oh, <laughs> go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, um, I mean, in a way, it's what is deemed as historical, but maybe even what, you know, these are public, many of these are public places, otherwise it wouldn't be a, a matter. So, you know, is the issue even that it always needs to be quote unquote historical? Because I think we have seen in almost all these cases, decisions are being made as to what is deemed to be historical and what is not um, authentic or, you know, um, a valid uh, uh, historical um, record. And I think, it seems, I mean, I'm more of a proponent um, of what Rosemary mentioned at the end, which I actually, as she was saying this, I was also thinking this, which is the idea that, you know, just like the body that the built environment, which it does already, it shows the marks of time of change of society. And um, so I, I guess I, I think because disability is still quite stigmatized and I think there isn't a broader discussion currently, especially in a lot of, uh, you know, sort of professional, but also lay historical societies, which is often where a lot of these decisions are made. Certainly that's the case in the Beacon Hill. Um, there just isn't a broader debate about what kinds of questions should be included and how the built environment should reflect what is going on in society. And so there, I mean, disability voices end up often in, at least in the discussions that I have examined, they end up being, for political reasons, often the way that cities are structures and the debates are structures, they end up being uh, opponents as opposed to being more collaborators. And I think, I think part of this is in the way that this takes place is, is related to the way that the kind of governance structures are sometimes organized as well. And even in the way that the law is implemented. So I think that there are a number of areas of intervention where more of the questions that Rosemary and David just asked and, and, and Sun Young asked that, but, and all of those things could, uh, you know, figure in more strongly, but there needs to be a more concerted effort at, at, in places that we don't always control. I'd like to follow up if I may, uh, this is Rosemary, on what Georgina was suggesting. Uh, one of the, again, claims of dis critical disability studies is that uh, people with disabilities don't, must live in a world not built for us. And that can lead to resourcefulness, but it also can lead to expertise and I think that one of David's most important provocations is 
what he was talking about in relation to Georgina, and that is how will it change preservation? How will it change the built environment if more actual people who identify as disabled are identified as disabled and who use the world differently because of what I call the human variations that we think of as disabilities, how that knowledge and expertise of this interaction between mind bodies considered disabled and a kind of already built and inherited world, how, how that will operate, how that will be generative in changing things. And what that means is a couple of things. One of the things is we have to be there. <laughs> so that means that people with disabilities need to be understood as members of institutional communities, uh, whether those institutional communities are educational communities um, or any kind of public communities. In other words, we need to be able to go to school. We need to be able to get jobs. We need to be able to be hired. And we need to be able to have some degree of authority and expertise in remaking the world in a just and inclusive way. And part of what works against that, and Georgina and I have talked a lot about this, and David, you may have to say, have something to say about that, and that is we aren't expected, we aren't imagined as being there. We are imagined as being somewhere else. We've talked a little bit about this, the recipients of something, uh, the people on the street corner, the people that are stigmatized, the people that are excluded, but in fact, we're everywhere. And it is our <clears throat> obligation, I think, to bring forward our expertise into whatever institutions or enterprises into which we can be involved to show how our presence transforms the world and makes it more just and equitable. I think that's um, a really uh, succinct way to to, um, uh, to consider those issues. Thank you. Um, let me. I'm going to combine um, a, a few questions. We have um, several questions that are about um, expanding this conversation, as well as bringing it into more um, intersectional discussions. So, um, one uh, attendee asked, um, "This conversation is very analogous, if not parallel, to many of the issues about access, integration, inclusion." facing higher education from not only a disability perspective, but also a gender, ethno-racial and socioeconomic perspective. My wheels are definitely turning. If anyone would like to speak um, to this issue, that would be nice. Um, regardless, I appreciate the ins insight being provided in this presentation. Also, uh, just to add to that, uh, one of the first questions asked um, mentions that the uh, World Health Organization's World Report on Disability promoted a, a more biopsychosocial model than I suppose we're using today that expands the idea of disability to include cognitive disorders, issues around trauma, I'm just adding that in, um, among other environmental factors and um, mental health, which certainly um, imbue an environment in need of preservation. Um, so does anyone, maybe Wanda also, if I may add, this will probably also has to do with what Rosemary raised, your ideas about, um, just to find the quote, um, at Heritage that materializes successive liberation uh, movements, right? I think that, that that's probably the heart of these questions. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we have, I think, a lot of work to do on a number of fronts in uh, our various institutions um, and public places to include a broader swath of the population. And I guess, you know, thinking about also Georgina's presentation, uh, the and everyone's presentation, frankly, but the idea that that there is really, there are many different points of view and uh, subjectivities that provide insight and whether we are talking about disability, sensory disabilities, or as, as the uh, questioner raises issues about socioeconomic status, gender, and other 
you know, minoritized populations, right? So I think I was thinking when Rosemary was talking that that um, people with disabilities need to be in all these different places. But yeah, and they need to be on like historic preservation boards, you know, and things like that. Um, and you know, I don't, I don't want to sound pessimistic, but I want to say, you know, optimistically, there is room for many different people on a lot in a lot of different spaces that are currently not um, as diverse and inclusive as they need to be. And I mean, in this moment that we're talking, you know, I think there are tons of institutions are penning these statements of inclusion and diversity and so forth. Um, and my question, a lot of times when I read the things coming across my email from my institutions um, is, you know, but what are you actually putting into place to proactively affect change? Um, so I'm a little bit, I don't want to be a cynic, but I'm a little cynical about institutional statements. I would like there to be an opportunity for, or I'm hoping that what's happening right now is a window where some real changes will take place. And that will be inclusive of a lot of different people that have been left out and whose perspectives would really enrich the built environment, since that's what we are talking about, and, uh, and the kind of concepts and practices of historic preservation. Yeah. Sunny, I, really, a, oh, I was just going to I was going to call on you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Did you did you have a specific thing I wanted to talk about? Because well, um, I was thinking you deal with the mother of all historical liberation movements, which is the French Revolution, which is you know so central. Yeah, I, I wasn't going to make people get admired in French Revolutionary history again, but um, I really liked um, Joseph Berry's um, point there and question in the chat box because I think the disability historians that I discourse with um, treat disability as a social category alongside gender, race, class, and that those intersections are very much at the heart of what I think many of us are studying. Um, on my part and just the material that I presented today, it's very much about kind of a working class disability and how do we get these, you know, kids begging off the streets. And it's, that's sort of part of the dialogue that leads to the creation of these first blind and deaf schools. It's very, these are very much working class institutions. Um, and I think that point, that intersectionality of class and um, gender and um, probably race as well comes together in Vonda's um, case studies because I feel like, um, and I don't think this came up in Vanda's presentation, but in your article, you mentioned how one of the suggestions um, was to raise, to like have pages lift um, Leodo Peter onto the presidential dais, like instead of building a ramp. And surely that kind of suggestion would not have been made if it was a man in the picture, I think. And so there are all these kinds of, you know, discourses that intersect. And I think, you know, part of our work that we're doing as scholars and historians is trying to understand how those come together. Anyone I could, else? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, Rob, please. Uh, quickly, from my point of view, you know, I'm, I'm a public uh, employee and I practice preservation on federal land according to uh, regulations drafted in federal legislation. And all of that encourages um, the practice of preservation in the service of maximizing public benefit for the greatest number of people. Um, there's all kinds of language in the laws and regulations that encourage public comment, public you know, um, intake of public opinion before making preservation decisions. So that is by no means a perfect system as implemented across the country, you know, not even in, in my backyard, but um, the tools are there. And I think um, public employees in particular can uh, take advantage of those tools and, and use them very seriously to expand the voices that can input um, into preservation decisions, input into the process of making public assets more accessible, more meaningful, more usable to more people. And that's really what government service should be about. So um, that's, that's something I take very seriously and encourage uh, you know, all of my public sector colleagues to do the same. Um, did somebody have anything to add before we move on to another? Okay. Um, we just have time for one more question and then we'll, we'll um, uh, um, get to some um, final thoughts. Um, just again to, I think I can condense several different people's um, questions. A, a recurring theme in several of the other questions concerns like how, rather than um, 
uh, create accommodations or adaptations towards disability? How, how do we begin with um, disability and human impairment when considering um, the future of the built environment? Um, and also how um, do we, um, one of the, uh, Jennifer Steger who's a professor at Johns Hopkins and, and works on this topic um, also asks like, how do we consider the, the, the um, ethical benefits that the public at large gets from disability labor and knowledge? Like, um, I think this speaks through all the work across history from Sonny, Sonny's um, examinations to all the way to Georgina's most recent work. How does one begin with these topics? Um, which, is very, which is very different than what we've seen today where um, we're all dealing with pre-existing structures that are then um, adapted in, in some way. Well, maybe I'll take a, a, a poke at it. I, um, uh, so if what you're asking is, is about going forward, um, that is to say, uh, you know, less about preservation and maybe about what, what, what's the future of architecture design, uh, you know, programming, education, different, um, it's different arenas. Um, around access. I mean, many, many observers have noted that when access is in the design from the outset, it not only works better, but it's more aesthetic and it's more usable by everyone. So a modern building that has, you know, that has a, a, a ramp you know, a ramped entrance um, rather than an existing building where the ramp is just sort of wheeled in and bolted on to the side uh, that the, the, the designed, designed access um, has both greater utility and greater aesthetic value. And, and so the question really is how do you um, leverage those ideas to different contexts? <laughs> Um, and I think part of it is, is still going back to what Rose Marie said that the disabled people are always understood to be somehow elsewhere. <laughs> um, and you know, that you only card us in at, on rare occasions um, to, to evaluate something or else that we wheel in and uh, complain about things. Um, so I think even the, the kind of the acknowledgement of that fact uh, would would make a difference, right? Just the acknowledgement that we're not elsewhere, but that we are, you know, everywhere and we're here, um, and that we have knowledge and expertise to impart. Uh, I mean, one thing this is it's a sort of practical consideration, but um, I've become kind of irritable about the, the idea of focus groups, you know, in all sorts of different projects, preservation and rehabilitation projects and different types of programming, you know, a bunch of people from whatever group is brought in as a focus group to sort of evaluate the situation. And it's always sort of evaluating something that's already been, you know, a fait accompli. Um, and, you know, so, or, or else saying, do you like this, this one or this one? And, you know, my response is often, well, I don't really like either of them, uh -huh. you know. Because you 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 sort of invented this without, uh, in, you know, without bringing anybody in from the to the drawing board. Uh, so I think that that simple idea that Rosemary put forward is that you know we're everywhere. Another way to think about this yeah. that um, this question that um, brings it firmly into the um, topic of today's panel and the the work of Jorge and his students is um, you know around the topic of reconstruction, right? Like. How do you begin with disability when um, the evidence is scant, but yet the historic structure will be, um, or historic site will be reconstructed? It could be archaeological, it could be um, uh, ruined from war, it could be, inter you know, it could deal with some of these other intersecting histories that we're talking about and like the, the history of enslavement and the important sites around that in the United States. So how, how does one begin with this topic, right? Which gets us completely outside the issue of um, authenticity and, well, I shouldn't say that, that potentially removes us from this, this balancing act that we always have to um, use with pre-existing structures. 
I wonder if in addition to, you know, leaving authenticity, I guess, in some ways behind as you were sort of suggesting, if the word access, um, which is of course the legal term, but is I think really limiting because as a practicing architect, um, uh, I wrote an article about, you know, how limiting uh, and how limited architects generally uh, approach disabled access. Um, and I think, you know, these laws are incredibly important as are the guidelines that Rob Thompson talked about, but they also end up kind of creating a very rote process. And so I think thinking about what we are trying to do is not as access, but as something much bigger, much more opening up to um, many people and giving insight or something like that. And I don't know what that word is. Maybe I'll come up with it, but maybe someone else will. Um, I, I think in a way that, that the word access kind of narrows uh, our objectives. This question is um, still requires some consideration for you. Also, um, we are hoping, you know, we would like to end at three o'clock. So if there's also any other final thoughts or issues that um, any of you would like to share that were raised or that you feel loose ends that, um, that need to be um, uh, tied up and addressed, please, please, we welcome your closing comments on this, on this topic. Oh, you have to unmute. I wanted to just follow up a little bit on what Georgina was saying, uh, following up on what I was saying, I guess, is uh, the idea of people with disabilities, that is to say, people who have knowledge that is that comes from some kind of atypical embodied experience, a mind body that is understood as atypical, um, that David's work has brought forward, I think really in a very powerful way. And that is that people with disabilities uh, have always been everywhere. So they were at the Acropolis um, because of course they were throughout all of human history. And that's part of a of a uh, a piece of historical knowledge that I think we have to hold on to, because we have a sense of a progress narrative, and I'm I put forward this kind of process narrative all the progress narrative all the time, that says um, you know in the mid 20th century we had the human and civil rights movements. And that has transformed the built environment to make it accessible to people um, with all sorts of human variations, whether we think of that as disability, race, gender, sexuality, who were previously excluded from public life. And that's partially right. That progress narrative is partially right, but it's also partially wrong. And I think we need to balance that important narrative of possibility with the narrative that David puts forward, and that is, you know, the Acropolis used to be filled with people with disabilities until, you know, they took down the ramp <laughs> and, and until I got there and then I couldn't get in. So I think these various historical narratives need to be blended together and brought forward simultaneously in order for us to do this important work. Thank you. Any other um, final thoughts um, as we head towards uh, three o'clock closing? I just add that um, building on Rosemary's point that historic buildings and historic landscapes, historic built environments are uniquely positioned and, and capable of carrying those messages from the deep past forward into the present. That's why I got into this business in the first place to experience that and be up close and personal with it. Um, so we've always got a tremendous amount to learn from the past and we can do no better than letting it inform our future outlook on things. Wanda, did you, you have something to add? No, I just wanted to 
thank everyone for great presentations and a really interesting discussion and for including me in it. I really enjoyed your presentation, by the way. <laughs> it was really great. It was, it's amazing to watch an article get condensed down to 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, it was a little challenging. <laughs> Very good. I'm sure for all of us. Sunny, was it? Oh, I was going to say ditto to what Avanda said. I mean, I guess um, one th point that I just wanted to say is that, you know, I think the problem that comes with um, preservation in its interaction with disability today comes from the sense that preservation has some solid history that you can look back on and say, see, this is what his historical preservation was and hence why we're reacting in this way. Whereas from my vantage point as a historian, you see that preservation was like really fluid in the way it was approached and that there was no one understanding of authenticity or, you know, like fossilization of a, of an, of, an, uh, of a structure in some past moment. And that once we start sort of like loosening up that understanding and realize that preservation has a complex history as well, that that allows us to approach disability and issues of access and inclusion or whatever other word we want to come up with um, in a more thoughtful way. Thank you. Now, Sun, uh, Sun Young, I feel like your presentation will um, really shift how people understand the, the history of preservation um, and, and teach it, actually. So it was really wonderful to see this contribution. It's, it was very provocative. Yeah, really Thank fantastic. Thank you. I hope so. Yeah. Um, any other? One, oh. one final note. Hi, everyone. This is uh, Lila Klamiji Sab. I just wanted to um, mention that we're getting lots of thank yous um, in the chat and in the Q&A. And I know that most of our panelists are not looking at that. So I just wanted to make sure that it's addressed, that the audience is very thankful for this discussion. And I also, as a final note, wanted to mention that um, Jorge has generously offered to mail a copy of the issue of Future Interior to anyone who would like to request one. Um, and you can do that by sending your mailing address, name and mailing address, um, via email to future.com anterior.journal at gmail.com. And I did put that into the chat um, for anyone to see so you can copy and paste it, but the words future.anterior.journal at gmail.com again. Um, so anyone who would like to request a free copy, sort of a little uh, treat for those of you who stayed with us throughout the whole conversation. And thank you again to all of our panelists for participating. Uh, we deeply appreciate this conversation and we're so delighted to have been able to bring you to GSAP. Thank you so much. Yep. Yes, thank you for having us. Great to be back. Yeah. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Nice you all. Thank you. Hopefully to be continued. Yes. Thanks, Jorge. Fantastic. Thank you yeah. so much.